much at this point. Um, that we're doing time period two, which is 1648 to 1815. So that's where we are. And we're on topic 4.4 .4 in the study guide. So a lot of this is based off the agricultural revolution, some of the changes we're going to see in population. We know that overall population is definitely going to increase across Europe during this time period. We have the <clears throat> long term combined health effects of higher caloric foods like corn and potatoes coming across as a result of the Columbian Exchange. We have not great, but slightly better understanding of human health and disease and um, all that by the very end. Uh, the first vaccination is smallpox, 1798. But mainly we're just gonna get better nutrition and that's going to allow people to live past childhood, which means they have a greater chance of living to adulthood and having children of their own. So we start to see pretty significant population growth. Um, that also means, however, that we still have a lot of poverty. So many of us are gonna wait till later to, on average to get married. Uh, marriage is almost always for economic purposes. It is not about love or companionship. It is about survival. So you have to bring something to uh, the marriage that makes you a good candidate. So that's some level, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a little dry this morning, some level of financial security. So many young women or men are going to have to work for several years and acquire a bit of money so they can bring that to a potential marriage. Of course, that does not mean that most of us wait to have sexual interactions. So we do see a rise in illegitimate births. We saw a clip uh, from the awesome uh, story of Britain. You know what I might do over the, I might need to rewatch that entire series again. I think I have time, so I'm gonna hook that up. Um, so maybe it's streaming now, I have to look it up. Maybe it is, and then I can give the link to you guys and you can watch it. Woohoo! Yes, uh, and then we can have like discussions. That'll be our post AP test activity. We'll discuss daily the episode of the history of Britain that you might, well, okay, probably not. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so regardless, um, we know that we're going to see a lot more illegitimate births. And so we'll see the rise of things like what they called uh, the foundling hospital, the orphanages, where we are going to start to take care of um, unwanted children, children abandoned, uh, children with parents who can't or don't want to take care of them, et cetera. And so we see the beginning of what will eventually flourish in the third time period of the beginning of modern social welfare systems uh, start to happen during this time period. All right. Um, yeah, and uh, the other thing that's in there that we should probably make sure we know, and I think you all know this, is we see a mass migration of people to cities as we start seeing improvements in agricultural production, things like the seed drill spreading out. Now, not all of Europe has this. It's going to be the British, and then eventually it will move to places like France and the Netherlands. Our eastern and southern friends are a little more backward in acquiring these new technologies, but we see many people moving to cities because they're not needed in the countryside. And in the early days of this process, many of us, the cities can't handle us. They don't have enough jobs for us. So we see a rise in crime. We see a rise in prostitution, all those kind of things. We have the world's first police force created early in time period three because we have more crime to deal with. Uh, and so we have police protection to help people, uh, usually rich people, so they have to deal with, you know, poor people. Oh, that kind of thing. All right. <clears throat> I mean, trust me, I understand. I avoid poor people if at all possible. As a high school teacher uh, who's fabulously wealthy, I totally get it and uh, avoid the poor as much as I can. Anyway, I do. Uh, this reminds me, uh, years ago, I had a student who was like, you're very critical of the, you like, your your uh, privileged East End attitude. And I was like, dude, I grew up on Dixie Highway. Like, I don't want to hear it. Um, you know, I wasn't living in a ditch, let's be honest, but I, I didn't grow up with a whole lot of money. So I don't want to hear that. And he was like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I was like, yeah. So talk about assumptions. Anyway, you start making fun of the South End. My, mm, my South Endedness comes out. Now I can make fun of the South End because I'm from there and I'm not moving back, but you can't unless you're from there, then I'll allow it. All right. Topic 4.5, 18th century culture and arts. We mentioned Baroque earlier. People like Caravaggio, one of my personal favorites. Uh, one of the books and Audible in my queue to listen to soon is a biography of Caravaggio, so I'm pumped for that. That's going to be fun. Um, <clears throat> Bernini, who does the great altar in St. Peter's Basilica, uh, the ecstasy of St. Teresa as she is overwhelmed by uh, Catholic Jesus's awesomeness and uh, makes her pass out with joy, all that good stuff. And then music like Handel, Bach, um, very complex stuff that is going to really engage your mind uh, and your thoughts. And that's really something that's important at that time. We do see a rise in what's called print culture as more people are learning how to read and write, not, you know, massive amounts, but double figures at least. So we see the rise of early newspapers, uh, more printing of books, things like that, that allow people to get access to information. <clears throat> 
we also talked, we saw in that video clip uh, back in the fall about the rise of consumer culture <clears throat> as we start getting more wealth in societies like Britain and France and things like canaries, like pets, uh, which a lot of people could not have afforded before, uh, dishes, China, stuff like that. And then we have the knockoff versions for those of us that can't quite afford the best stuff from China. So the Dutch start producing their own. When I was in the Dutch, uh, the Netherlands in Belgium in January, I went to the city of Delft because uh, there, there's a lot of uh, Baroque artists there. Vermeer, for example, is from Delft. But they produce what's called Delftware, which is kind of like the Target version of Chinese porcelain. So it was the more affordable version of that stuff for people. So we have knockoffs today. They had knockoffs back then. So that's kind of how that worked. All right. And then 4.6, the enlightened uh, approaches to power. We have what is called enlightened absolutism. We're still dictators. We still hold the power to do whatever we want to, but we start to show some flexibility to, to adapt to newer ideas. Can anyone think of an idea that might be considered? Because obviously the other thing is you have to remember, we're not going to become democratic. That would take away our own power, our own influence. So that's not going to happen. But what kind of reforms might an enlightened absolutist be willing to engage with? At least in Prussia, limited religious tolerance. Excellent. Great answer. It's probably the most predominant. Anybody think of another one? Uh, at least one more, perhaps? <clears throat> do we still have feudalism, do you think, in Central and Eastern Europe in the 18th century? We do. So what is one way a monarch can show their enlightened interests, perhaps? Emancipating the serfs. Correct. <clears throat> So probably the most famous of all these is going to be Frederick the Great of Prussia. He's still a warmonger. He still executes people that oppose him, all those things. But he does show religious toleration. He builds a synagogue in Berlin, for example. He frees the serfs on his own land. He doesn't do it nationally because basically the entire culture of Prussia is a military-based one. And the way that this man gets loyalty from his nobles is to basically let them run their lands as they see fit. And then whenever he needs soldiers, they give him soldiers. Um, and so that's why he basically stays out of that. But on his own land, he frees his serfs. Uh, some places we have limited freedom of the press. Um, we allow some editorializing and some reporting, which is obviously not something that's very common at the time period. So there are some changes, but for the most part, uh, with the exception of Great Britain and the Netherlands, we are still absolute monarchies across the continent, even all the way up to 1815. We know France has a variety of different things going on here at the end, but I would not say Napoleon is someone who, I mean, he's a tyrant, he's a dictator, just like his, you know, Louis XIV in many ways. All right. <clears throat> so topic 4.7 is something we've already covered. Oh, no, that's because that's it's a review. Duh, the last one's a review. I'm an idiot. Moving on. Unit 5. <clears throat> Unit 5. So let's do that. So this is, again, still time period 2. 1648 to 1815, um, the rise of global markets. So we see an increase in international trade. I would argue we are absolutely globalized during this time period. Uh, we saw it with silver in the previous time period, trading to China from Europe and the Americas, but we absolutely have much more um, seafaring trade. And you could definitely argue during this time period is when the Europeans start to flex and become dominant naval powers and economic powers. The British take over India in 1757, um, we will see the Dutch establish some control in places like the in Indonesia. Um, India remains, uh, you know, part of it is controlled by the Portuguese. Most of African states are still independent. China is technically still independent, but we definitely see more influence and um, trade networks taking place around the world. All right. We mentioned this the other day, but we'll mention it again. Great Britain is the world's greatest power by 1815. They do so by defeating France in a series of wars, most prominently the Seven Years' War, which ends in 1763. Just think of this. We all know this because we're Americans and you took American history last year. Great Britain loses its number one colony, its most wealth-providing colony, and literally continues to rise unabated as the world's greatest power. Part of that is because they replaced basically us with India because India's chief export is cotton. And we know that the early industrial factories are primarily making cotton textiles. Britain cannot grow cotton. Remember, you're talking about a thousand miles north. London is basically on the same line of latitude as Toronto. So, um, and I love Toronto, but a couple of years ago, I went there for spring break and I was the only idiot that went north for spring break that year. And it was snowing when I got there. 
So, um, yeah. And for some reason, my iPad would only work to watch the NCAA tournament final in the bathtub in my hotel room. So I sat in the bathtub <laughs> with no water, not taking a bath, but that's the only place the Wi-Fi worked. So it was very, very odd. So I watched uh, the NCAA final uh, in a Canadian hotel bathroom bathtub. So that's a fun story. Anyway, um, yeah, good times. Weird things happen when you travel. So, um, and I didn't know a soul in Toronto. So I was like, yeah, I go to a bar. I go out and watch the game. I was like, I don't want to do that. So I watched it in my hotel bathtub. Uh, most places I go, I know people and I stay with them or something like that. But I, I was just like, I've never been to Canada. Let's go, let's go to Canada. And why I did that in April, I don't know. It was a lovely city, but, you know, eventually when we can travel again, summer, a. Eh? Um, so anyway, um, that's Britain becoming a dominant power six or 5.4. We've got the French revolution. Now we spent a lot of time on this. You guys did some really good presentations. Uh, so I imagine you remember at least your portion of the revolution decently well. Just remember that the broad story is as follows. We need to look at the causes, a couple of the things that happen and the effects, because that's all we would get in a DBQ. So we're not worried about a lot of the detail. You don't need to worry about this stage versus that stage. That is absolutely not something that's gonna be on a DBQ, so we don't worry about that. Um, plus, we can't even agree on when the French Revolution ends. Some people say it ends when Napoleon takes power. I would argue, your textbook argues that it ends when Napoleon leaves power. So it's still debatable. There's no ironclad answer. It's, it's like most things in history interpretive. So we know the French Revolution has a variety of causes, some short term, some long term. Can any of you uh, brilliant folks remind me of a cause of the French Revolution? Why does this happen in the spring of 1789? There's famines in France. Okay, absolutely. Short term, there's famine. So that exacerbates uh, a lot of the long term conditions that were already negative in the country. True. Good. Um, anybody think of one, any of those long-term consequences? What is something that has been brewing for a while and finally spills over during this time period? I'm going to extend that coffee metaphor. Is it the debt that the country's facing with the taxation of like the working class? It is absolutely correct that the high taxation policies, the unfair taxation policies, the estate system, the church leaders, the clergy, the nobles pay no taxes, even though combined they own about a third of the land, they pay no taxes on it. We're afraid of making those people angry. So we just go, well, what can we do? And we of course have in the third estate, which is 97% of the population, we have the growing bourgeoisie, the middle class. Many of these people are even richer than the nobles, but they don't have the historic last name, so they don't get certain privileges. They um, have to pay taxes, so there's a lot of frustration amongst those people, and they will be the leaders of your revolutionary group, in theory doing so in the name of the average person. Not so much, but that's at least what they say. So who are we truly upset with that causes all this to happen? Who do we blame for these challenges? Reminder, you're living in a city named after him currently. King Louis the 14th. Not the 14th. Oh, the 16th. Fly me in, Elizabeth. Uh -huh. I don't know what Elizabeth is in French, but we'll just go with Elizabeth. Uh -huh. So, yeah, Louis the 16th. He's the dumb one. Not the brightest bulb in the, in the sleeve. He refuses to make a bold decision. He does not want to make anybody angry. He doesn't want to upset the nobles by taxing them. So he just basically says, like, I don't know what to do. Um, he calls in the Estates General, the Parliament, the legislative branch that hasn't met in 175 years. He can make any decision he wants to, but he wants to have the other people make decisions, which is literally the worst kind of leader. Even if you mess up, you're going to own those choices. When you, Nobody likes the boss that refuses to make decisions. Like, that's literally why you're the boss. I need you to make choices. Okay? Because that's why you have that title. And that's why you get paid more than I do. So you go for that. Um, because we're all going to make mistakes, we can forgive that. It's the, I did nothing, is the worst way to go about it. So the, the, the indecision is, is not a good thing. Um, we know in the early stages of the revolution, we're going to be fairly liberal. Our goal is to make changes. The bourgeoisie are going to neuter the power of the king, uh, put him under house arrest when he is dragged from the, the Palace of Versailles by my favorite event of the French Revolution, the March of the Women, when they're heavily armed and angry and demand something, and they drag the royal family back, not literally, but metaphorically, they ride in a carriage, but they go back to Paris where they will spend the rest of their lives under house arrest, uh, right close to the Louvre, the former palace that is now an art museum. And <clears throat> we're gonna see some good productive changes. We are going to tax the church. Uh, we do some things that aren't terribly liberal though. We make the church uh, 
leadership, the, the bishops, the, the archbishops, the nuns, the priests, they have got to agree to become an employee of the state of France. So that's not liberal. That's not separation of church and state. That's not the enlightenment that John Locke wrote about. So the French Revolution is always the best way to describe it is it's fairly mixed bag. They, there are things all over the political spectrum happening at various points. But what tends to happen is within a year or so, we've kind of gotten complacent and there is a split. There are those who believe we have done the right thing. We've made choices. The king is no longer in power. Uh, they, if you don't remember the name, that's okay. But they are called the Girondin or Girondistes, the G ones. Um, and then we have those radicals, the Jacobins, who believe that we have not done enough and we must continue. And their number one thing is as long as the king lives, some of the nobles who have left the country could try to raise an army and come back and put him back on the throne. So the only way to ensure that this will truly work is the king has to die. Even though seven nations come out in 1791 and 1792 and say, if you do this, we will invade you. And the radicals are like, cool. So they will, when they take power, draft the largest army in the history of the world at that point, over half a million men in 1792, when ever, like the Revolutionary War a decade earlier, you're seeing battles of like 2,000 versus 3,000. These dudes got half a million. So they're basically, come at me, bro. And that's definitely what's going to happen. So in the midst of a revolution, we also have wars with multiple European states. It's a rather chaotic time. Of course, the most infamous part of the revolution when the Jacobins take power is the radical reign of terror. We decide that the way to create order in France is to execute those who have any disagreement with us. We don't have a good number, but it's somewhere between 15 and 50,000. Uh, even if it's only 15,000, that is still a massive number to execute when even today's worst dictators execute about 1,000 a year. Nations like Saudi Arabia or China, Iran, the numbers we have, they execute about 1,000 to 1,500 a year. So is 15,000 the lowest number we have for this in a year and a half a lot? Uh, yeah, that, that's a whole lot. Of course, Robespierre loses his mind. A lot of things that were intentioned to be to help people also end up turning badly. We have riots. We have you know, people in jail are ripped out and literally killed by bare hands. We chop off the guy in the Bastille's head and walk around the city of Paris with it. We just, we go nuts. We do a lot of really bad things that are immoral in many ways, but it's a great example of mob behavior uh, that we do things oftentimes in groups we would never do on our own. And that's something that is kind of an innate part of human nature, I think. So long story short, we also probably, the, the other thing that's most famous about the reign of terror is we try to remove Christianity from public life. This is something that does not go well with the average person. Uh, France has been a Catholic nation for, you know, 2,000 years almost. Um, it's a huge part of their culture and their belief system. So to take away people's faith is not something that is well respected. Uh, infamously, the Church of Notre Dame, <clears throat> which I just saw uh, last week was the anniversary, the one-year anniversary of that fire. Uh, it seems like that was about 14 years ago. Um, but I had hair and was skinny when that fire happened, at least in my recollection right now, but that was a year ago last week. So, um, but Notre Dame was attacked. Um, the, the, many of the things inside the church are destroyed and burned because, uh, the Catholic church is just wrong and terrible. And this is something most people in France strongly di disagree with. We have that goofy calendar. So people forget what day of the week it is. So they can't want to go to church because they don't remember when church would have been. I mean, all that kind of stuff. As many of us are saying right now, it is not hard to make people forget what day of the week it is with that normal routine. I don't know about you all, but half the time when I wake up, I'm like, who? Huh? Uh, because oftentimes we know the day of the week by the, the calendar we keep. And right now all of our calendars are relatively similar. So therefore that's, you know, it, I, I, and for, for the rest of my career, when I teach this, I'm going to make this example um, until I get really at the end of my career and people are like, what pandemic? And they don't even remember it. Oy. And you all say, Mr. Rich, I could, go. well, I started teaching right after 9-11, and that was before you guys had any cognition of that. So time marches on, it will, and eventually this will be a distant memory. But um, many of us, if not all of us, will remember the details of it because it was something that we lived through. But, you know, the generation after you all won't. They just, they just won't. It will be something they read about or hear from their parents or their siblings or whatnot. So anyway... Um, we know that um, women are not allowed to participate very much. They start at the beginning, but as radical as this revolution is, women are still on the fringes. Uh, a famous example, Olympe de Gouges, who is a woman who simply, because she has a friend who's a publisher, takes the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, the major document of the revolution, and changes the male nouns and pronouns to female. That's all she does and has it printed as a political statement that women are being left out. She is executed during the Reign of Terror for such insolence. 
changing words in a document. That's mm, you women, you stay in your place. So the big effects are, of course, this spreads to the rest of the world. We see other revolutions in other places. We know we'll see other revolutions uh, like in the colonies of the New World. We know Haiti, uh, the Spanish colonies, Portugal. We will eventually see other revolutions in Europe in this time period, like or the next time period, like in 1830, in 1848. Uh, the French Revolution has a huge part uh, in helping create modern nationalism because Napoleon uh, inspires great love amongst his own citizens and they band together. Napoleon also helps create what we know as public schools. So we teach history as propaganda, basically, where everything France did was great. Napoleon's a wonderful leader. So we have the world's first modern national anthem, which is still their national anthem to today, La Marseillaise. And that's really important. He also creates nationalism in the countries he invades because they band together because they hate him. And we know the next time period, we'll see the unification for the first time ever of Germany and Italy, two nations that are conquered and, and uh, you know, occupied by Napoleon for a decade plus. So we see that the beginnings of unification in an attempt to fight against foreign oppression. You know my favorite analogy, five fingers versus the fist. So that is why we do that. All right. So those are some of the major impacts of that. Now, the last part here is going to be Napoleon. They put Napoleon as separate, which again is fine, whatever. So we have three things left, Napoleon, the Congress of Vienna, and Romanticism. So we'll do those three and then we're good to go. So we know Napoleon rises as a military figure. He's a general. We know throughout history, many of our leaders have first gained popularity through military exploits. I mean, I don't know exactly what the number is, but I'd imagine at least a fourth of all the way up to a third of American presidents have been soldiers during wartime. Maybe not leaders like Grant or something, but JFK fought in World War II. Uh, you know, uh, Ford was in the was in war as a younger man. Uh, all that kind of stuff. They they're in army, so that's that's a huge part of most of our history. As we look at these military heroes as someone who are, would also be good politicians, and sometimes that's true, and sometimes it's not. But Napoleon is going to take over in a coup a military overthrow in 1799. He is 30 years of age. He does it with two other guys. Eventually he sheds those two dudes and he will become eventually emperor for life in 1803. He will make peace with the Catholic church. He will create the unified bank of France. He will create public schools. Uh, they're not mandatory, but they certainly are, I would argue the greatest opportunity to create more chances for success for most of the population. When you look at the middle class, what creates a large middle class anywhere in the world, it is public schooling and industrialization. And so we will see those things at the end of this time period and the beginning in the middle of the next. Napoleon is also an expert military hero. I don't know a lot of the details about it, but if you study military theory and battlefield strategy, he is one of the greatest who ever did it. So big ups for Napoleon, God of war. All right, he conquers huge chunks of Europe. Eventually, of course, he will lose in Russia because he gets stuck in winter. Bad idea. Um, a lot of his dudes get sick. He abandons his soldiers, goes back to Paris, and then two years later is captured and sent to an island in the middle of nowhere uh, the second time, and he will die on that island in 1821. So I would argue of all the people we study, uh, he might be the most important person in terms of his impact uh, that we study in AP Euro in any depth. And I left out about 25 things he did. So, I mean, he's fairly significant in many, many ways. Um, some of them good, many of them not good, but they love him in France today. You go to visit his grave, it's inside what used to be Louis XIV's private chapel, and he is inside of seven coffins, like a Russian doll. So that's kind of interesting. And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful Baroque church, um, right smack dab in the middle of Paris. It's right across the street from the Rodin Museum, where you can see the original thinker. In fact, the last time I was there, I did a very artistic shot because I'm a wonderful photographer. Not really, but every once in a while I get lucky. And you have Rodin doing this. And in the back, you see the golden, the golden dome of Napoleon's tomb, which is like, nah, like 99% of people don't care, but you know, I'm a nerd, so whatever. All right, so what do we do? Our major concern is to make sure that Napoleon and the French Revolution never happen again, that we do not see a resurgence of these, for example, killing kings. That's kind of scary. And as the old saying goes, when Europe, uh, when France sneezes, Europe catches cold. So our concern is that other states will follow the French example. We got to stop that. So the period, um, even though the Congress of Vienna goes past 1815, the actual agreement is 1815. So that's why your uh, college board includes it in this time. They're basically like, no way, we're not going to let it happen. So it's a very reactionary period. The, the goal is to put old monarchs back on the throne. The goal is to um, work together. We willingly lower the amount of troops we have. 
We willingly lower the amount of cavalry, the amount of artillery, so cannons and whatnot, because Napoleon could do what he did because his army was just bigger than everybody else. And um, so we can't let that happen. So we're going to willingly minimize the sizes of our military. We also punish France, but not vindictively. France is a part of the negotiations. Again, back in the day, the College Board loved the compare and contrast, the Congress of Vienna and the Treaty of Versailles for World War I. Not this year, of course, because that's technically not in our content due to the lack of uh, many schools getting to finish the content. Slow people. Ugh. But um, that is how that works. And so it, we know the Treaty of Versailles, the Germans are excluded, bad things happen, World War II, yada, yada. The Congress of Vienna, France is like, cool, we deserve it. We understand. So that's fair and we'll do our part. And then France is immediately welcome back in. They're not isolated. It's kind of like if you get grounded when you're off grounded, we don't hold a grudge for six months. Uh, one of my favorite sayings somebody told me a long time ago, I can't really remember who, they said, when you bury the hatchet, be sure to include the handle. Because the metaphor being, if you lead the hatchet up out of the ground, you can pick it up again and start swinging it at people. So if you're going to forgive people, you got to forgive them. You can't like kind of forgive them and then still be mad at them because that's not going to be good. So I think that's, that's also true of societies. Europe is very prosperous in the period after um, Napoleon versus we know after World War I, not so much. So sometimes forgiveness is hard, but it's the best thing we can do for ourselves and for others. And that's true in many situations. Not that I'm always good at forgiving, but I try to remember that. History teaches us a lot, uh, even sometimes when we don't want to. And then the last thing, 5.8, is romanticism. This is the major cultural movement that starts. A lot of the major romantic figures are going to be past 1815, but it starts earlier. There are several different veins of romanticism. Um, things like, uh, and, and there's like a dozen different things, and I know you all covered this in literature as well. Emotion. Uh, the previous version, neoclassicism, was very much like reserved and, you know, marble statues and things like that. Uh, rational, thoughtful. This is more emotion. So, ah, um, you know, like it's okay to be upset by everything that's happening. It totally is. Uh, even if you're safe and happy and well, it's still okay to be frustrated. It's fine because we, I think we have a better understanding that if the more we keep our emotions inside of us, the longer those can poison us. And we have to sometimes let those out. That's hard, but that's, that's, that's some, that something we all have to do in our own way. Um, we also see things like nature is really important because, of course, the Industrial Revolution, we're inside all the time. There's big, nasty machines and, and uh, it's pollution and, and all those things. And so get outside. And you hear a lot of people say that right now. Like, today's going to be a beautiful day. It's supposed to be 70 degrees. Go outside, even if it's just to sit for a bit. It's just good to not be inside all the time. Now, when it's 40 degrees, I get it. But when it's 70 this afternoon... Get yourself out there if you can. That's my plan, at least anyway. Get a little sun. I know I'm pale, but that's okay. I'm trying. Um, and uh, it's going to challenge basically the Enlightenment. Uh, we'll talk about other ideas in the next unit, but that's basically the introduction to Romanticism. So those are the big concepts of this time period. These are getting shorter and shorter because as I go through, I realize I, I could do this for three hours, but you're writing one essay. There's no point. So if you want to,